this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Over 25 years helping leaders reducing errors from incidents. Here is your host of the Essential Leadership Cycle Podcast, Rob Fisher. Hi, and welcome to episode four of the Essential Leadership Cycle Podcast. I'm your host and intentional leader, Rob Fisher, coming to you from the AeroHP.com studios in the Fit Center for Excellence here in beautiful North Carolina. In the last episode, we described the second attribute of the Essential Leadership Cycle, shared vision and values. I hope listeners immediately use some of the recommendations at the end of the podcast to start making changes in their intentional leadership. By now, you should have downloaded the eColors app and are using that information to manage your your strengths and potential limiters in your day-to-day interactions. In this episode, I'm going to discuss the third attribute of the essential leadership cycle, clarity of roles and processes. Once we're moving towards a better awareness of ourselves and our team, and we're working on creating and verifying a shared vision and values, then we can start to ensure that the roles of our team are clear and our processes are usable and technically accurate. If you ask any good actor, they'll tell you that the better they understand a role, the better they can play that role. I'm not saying our workforce is made up of actors, but the premise still holds. The better people understand the roles you're asking them to play in your organization, the better they can be equipped to play that role successfully. I remember years ago while working with the Department of Energy facility, we were helping them incorporate the human performance concepts into the DOE structure. One of the methods we used was to provide each person with the four categories they need to be successful, or what became known as R2A2, roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and authorities. What role do I play? And how does that role, title, or job relate to the visions and values of the organization? Why does the organization need someone to do this role and why is it me? Responsibilities. What am I responsible for? What are my tasks or jobs and who am I responsible to? Is my my responsibility limited to outcomes or also processes? Accountabilities. What am I accountable for specifically? Is it my performance, my team's performance, and who am I personally accountable to for those things? And authorities. What do I have the authority to do and what don't I have the authority to do? What are the limits of those authorities and why? We also use a technique called mutual expectations. What do you need from me to be successful? And what do I need from you to help you be successful? In addition to understanding our roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and authorities, or what we need to, we do, it's the obligation of the organization to help us understand how we do that. It's been said that consistency of outcome requires consistency of method and that an allowance in the variability of the method is also an acceptance that that variability of outcome is okay. In any task the workforce does, whether it's a technical task in the field, an engineering task, a support task, or an administrative task, your very business existence and the safety of your people can ride on the predictability of the outcome of the process. Don't get me wrong. I've been on board with the difference between work as imagined versus work as done since Todd Conklin and I sat down at a table in Norway years ago and mapped it out. That doesn't mean we don't correctly and accurately try to describe the methods and outcomes, but this has been misinterpreted lately. In fact, many of you work in worlds that there is a regulatory requirement for procedures and processes to be up-to-date, accurate, usable, and available. If these sound familiar, they're some of the systemic drivers associated with deviations. There's also five known error traps that really drive challenges in procedures and processes or any written guidance. The first one is field decisions. When a user has to make a decision with little or no input, it drives the probability for error. The second one is difficulty. Now, this can be mental difficulty, things that are hard to remember, or physical difficulty, things that are hard to do. 
The third one is vague or misleading information. Don't mistake flexibility for ambiguity. Those are different things. Flexibility says, here's your box. Stay in it. Ambiguity or vagueness says, there's a box out there. Go find it and get in it. The fourth one is conflicting information. When a user of, of written guidance sees, hears, or thinks something different or that is in conflict with what they expect, it provides a distraction that leads them to a higher error rate. And the last one is multiple or embedded actions. If you have three or more actions in a single step, then you actually drive error rate. Or if you embed actions in a place that they don't belong, like a note, a caution, a warning, a precaution, or a limitation, then you actually drive people to miss that action because it's somewhere where they don't belong. How many of these top five do you think the people that develop your written guidance actually know? And do they know how to deal with them? You know, one of my least favorite things to hear is when a leader says, we've got good processes. If we could just get people to follow them, we'd be okay. It really makes the hair stand up on the back of my neck because it shows a critical misunderstanding of what tends to drive incidents. It also shows that the leaders haven't bought into the concepts of understanding human error and human and organizational performance. I remember a few years ago, a senior leader sent an email after several fatalities in the organization that said, we've got good processes and procedures, and if you follow them, you'll be safe. And if you don't, then you may wind up like those teammates. Not only did this seem to imply that it was the workers' fault that they were killed in a workplace incident, but that it was also their fault and they didn't follow procedures that would have worked. Now, this email was sent to over 200,000 employees directly from this senior leader before the first step of any incident analysis process was even started. Unfortunately, when they did do the analyses, it was discovered that in neither case of the fatalities were the processes clear and accurate for the tasks the worker was tasked with doing. That sounds systemic for me. The processes were riddled with the five error traps. And this doesn't seem like an individual problem. It seems like something that the organization is responsible for when protecting the workers from being hurt, maimed, or killed. So what can you do? First, sit down with some of your folks and have a conversation about roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and authorities. Write them down and make some agreements. Next, create a mutual expectations document, one that you can occasionally revisit to make sure that you're both on a good path for success. Take each other's personality tendencies into account so that it makes sense to both of you. By the way, this works at home too. Look at the way your organization writes, reviews, approves, and uses written guidance. Many organizations that struggle with what they believe to be adherence to procedures and standards actually have a much deeper systemic problem with the quality and usability of those procedures and processes. Learn to recognize the top five written guidance error traps and to minimize them in your processes. Go out and engage with people. Have a discussion about what we're talking about. See if you don't start to get different input and answers than you were getting in the past. Until next time, this has been your host, Rob Fisher. Thanks for listening. And remember, intentional leadership starts with you. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen. This is no ordinary sub shop. This is Firehouse Subs. Welcome to Firehouse. 
Tired of overpriced lunches that underdeliver on flavor? Head to Firehouse Subs, where for a limited time you can get a $4.99 choice sub. Choose from a medium smoked turkey, Virginia honey ham, or roast beef. They're custom-made hot subs at a price ready-made to make you smile. Just $4.99, only at Firehouse Subs. Enjoy more subs, save more lives. Participating locations plus tax limited time offer prices may vary for delivery. This is no ordinary sub shop. This is Firehouse Subs. Welcome to Firehouse. Tired of overpriced lunches that underdeliver on flavor? Head to Firehouse Subs, where for a limited time you can get a $4.99 choice sub. Choose from a medium smoked turkey, Virginia honey ham, or roast beef. They're custom-made hot subs at a price ready-made to make you smile. Just $4.99, only at Firehouse Subs. Enjoy more subs, save more lives. Participating locations plus tax limited time offer prices may vary for delivery.